So team commitment. So to build the team commitment, uh, the tool here is the founder shareholder agreement. So basically the, this is the key essence to capture that the formation phase in, in one hand, it, it, it's a validation that the form, form, uh, formation phase is passed, that you have arrived uh, to become and start the next phase with as best foundation as possible. The, the quality of the shareholder agreement and the quality of the team and the, the key elements, vision, mission, strategy, how clear they are, how understandable they are, how aligned they are, is a validation of how good Quality wise is the foundation to actually go after the next phase, which is then the, the, the validation of the product service or innovation potential, and also validation of how effective the team is working instead of um, yeah, having come together and committed and working so far. So basically it means that no longer is there just random resources, there isn't just unclear commitments, there's not any more unclear IPRs, and credibility-wise, it's, it's much stronger, not random anymore. So, if no shareholder agree, agreement, agree, uh, agreement exists, it basically makes it very hard, close to impossible, to make consistent plan and scheduled actions because many of the core elements are not uh, cleared and agreed and communicated. So the, the problem will occur only later on, uh, even if you feel that there is no problem and these are all just too much and we should just keep moving forward. These are then decisions to knowingly take risks if being aware of these things. And most people are just not aware of these things and that's why they don't don't really do this because there's not too many out there uh, communicating about these or services going into this much of uh, details and explaining the business rationale behind these uh, points. Just some basics of the shareholder agreement in general. It's important to understand that it's not any type of uh, mandatory company registration document. So even if you're registering a company, the shareholder agreement uh, as a tool doesn't come across as mandatory thing. Uh, when we talk about uh, shareholder agreement, we focus on the business side, business reasoning, business rationale, why do those agreement is valuable as a tool, and uh, we focus less on the legal side. The legal side is important, but it's important to understand that there's two sides to it. If the business reasoning doesn't make sense, there's no point of having it for legal purpose. So the business first, legal second, but both are important. You have different shareholder agreement for different purposes. The core and what we focus here today and what we support the most is the core co-founders agreement between the core co-founders because it captures all of these essential things uh, from the uh, founding, founding and formation phase. Then there can be extended co-founding team a shareholder agreement, it can be same, extended to include this, or it can be totally separate a shareholder agreement just created for the advisors and investors. Uh, ex ex extended operative team, it can, there needs to be something uh, in context of their shareholding as well. Again, it can be a totally different agreement or extended. Uh, our recommendation is that uh, you use different uh, shareholder agreements for different purposes, but usually uh, specifically investors will definitely want to have their own version and, and driving that and usually also a united one so that there's only one shareholder agreement existing, uh, at least for the main shareholder stake, stakeholders. But you should not let the shareholder agreement be done or dictated only from investors' perspective because they have a different uh, business model. Their model includes 
majority of your comp companies failing where they are involved, where you as co-founder hopefully has a target of succeeding with your venture, regardless of the likelihood. But you shouldn't have that by design, the business model against you. So important and value of having core co-founder shareholder agreement first is that you can then have a clear understanding of the types of new terms and rules that are put in place as part of the investors joining. And therefore you can more clearly separate um, what are the new things that you need to understand now that were not in our previous agreement discussed. So the shareholder agreement as a template and as a tool and finally as an agreement really helps to, to uh, document and then with your signature you commit to these uh, points that you put and you need as a foundational element and then some additional things like IPRs, roles, responsibilities, uh, ownership allocations and so forth. So now you can imagine if there is no such document in place that it's, it's basically everyone agrees to it, then by definition how can you validate that none of these things even have been discussed together, agreed and, uh, and it has a meaning when people sign documents of this nature because it also includes the right for the ownership. So it's it's very important and you should not let and build entity structures without having something like this agreed, discussed in place before. And if you do, you should quickly revisit and make sure that you have these types of things. And if, if you have seen the movie, the social Social uh, network, aka the Facebook story, which is of course a movie, but it includes uh, a lot of factual things. Uh, whether they played out exactly like that or somehow differently, but they are based on the true stories of all the types of problems that happened because of there was never a shareholder agreement in place in the first place. And the expectations were actually not aligned at all in the beginning. And, uh, and so forth. So while it's a, it's a great movie, it's a great success story, but it could have happened so many ways differently than it, the outcome was. Now, as a process wise to execute the shareholder agreement, you should have main discussions about all of the topics that we have covered so far. Uh, use mentors and advisors to help guide those dis discussions or share perspective into your questions that you may have. Uh, get more perspective, never trust one individual mentor or advisor, get perspective, test other advisors' recommendations to another advisor for, pers uh, for additional perspective. But most important here is the conversations among the team members. Then you should use a template. We have a free template on our website that you can use as a guideline to draft point by point what you think about should be there in, the, in the, your shareholder agreement. Then have a lawyer who knows startups and knows business law to check your draft version and get their feedback and questions and uh, check it for inconsistency. And, and other recommendations and, and get their feedback and other open questions and then finalize your discussions to the point where all of the team members will feel comfortable of signing that. And if needed, then, then, then adjust something and, and have a lawyer double check it before. And then it's the time for the commitment. And the commitment for shareholder agreement, it should be significant if you're co-founder level, that it's at least three, three years perspective. It should feel like a big commitment, uh, like a relationship or even a marriage type, but it should not feel bad. It should not feel wrong. 
it's not, it should not feel that you are forced into that agreement. It should not feel that the elements in the agreement that you are not comfortable with them. Because if you have those feelings, then you should not commit. Walk away from the agreement, say that you're not the right team member, regardless of what role you came in. Or continue to have those conversations until you feel comfortable. Because that's your commitment and that's everyone's commitment and you should be able to trust your own commitment and the commitment of others. And then when you all have that feeling, this is a very valuable, very strong document uh, when it comes to discussing with other more serious uh, parties that you are looking to attract to your venture, whether this is big companies as customers, whether these are investors, whether these are additional team members, if they can see how you have accomplished these things at this point, they will definitely see you in different light than many of the other ventures out there. So the key points to really cover and agree in the shareholder agreements and the typical points you will find in each of them is first of all intellectual property rights, IPR. So now if we just look at from the legal perspective and where the, the, the typical problems exist is that the company is its separate legal person. It's like you and your co-founder are separate. It's like you or your child is a separate. You may have some agreed things, you may have some you know, rights or laws uh, regulating what you can and can't do. But in reality, there's a lot of freedom, as there should be. In basically, it means that the company has no assets whatsoever. So, for example, you as an individual, whatever you know, text content you create, whatever logo you design, whatever code you write, whatever um, business deal you make, if there is no document of what rights does the company has, for this, basically, it means the company has no rights. So if there's a developer coding as your co-founder team, even if they have ownership, it doesn't automatically mean that the company can use the code and sell the product that the code or the service that the code makes possible. So in the agreement, it basically says that the company has right to use all the intellectual property created as part of the work into making business. This is like the simple way. It can then have different variations, like it can rent the rights, it can, it, it gives usually the ownership in return of these rights and the contribution of time. But basically this is the whole point, that the company itself needs to have these rights. And you can imagine if there's a problem between co-founders, like again the story, uh, the Facebook movie, then there can be serious fights and it, it can be even terminal fights in regards that those can never be resolved. Did the company has rights to these uh, contributions or not? And uh, regardless, that's not, even if those can be resolved, all of that time and effort is away from actually competing in the marketplace. So you want to make these things clear, as clear enough, and from the very beginning. Same for competition clauses, confidentiality. People have different kind of ways of considering confidentiality. What is, you know, behind the curtain, our own stuff, versus what do we communicate externally? So if there's nothing agreed, then people will, you know, kind of figure their own level. And that may not be the level that other co-founders feel comfortable or investors or customers even. So you need to figure out what this is. The competition clause, specifically in the beginning when you necessarily can't be there full time, is like, okay, if you are doing studies or you're working with some other companies or doing some other projects for, for financing the ability to contribute for this venture, then where does the line go? Like, what can I use? What can I, what I can't use? If I code this product, can I use it here? Can I only use it here? Can I use my time there? Can I use the, the things that we learn here? Can I use it there? And so forth. And in minimum, this 
actually makes it clear what other re responsibilities each of the co-founders have because of this conversation. Communication among partners to the agreement. This is basically meaning that uh, if I as an as individual co-founder have some issues, how can I trigger a meeting between founders? So how are we going to communicate if we need to change something or we need to question something in regards of the agreement? Any, any topics covered in the agreement. So this can be, for example, saying that if any individual co-founder sends an email to everyone and, uh, and, and 10 days after that, there should be a partners meeting discussing for two hours. And if anyone doesn't, if anyone without acceptable reason can, will not join, they are breaching the agreement. So, but these types of mechanisms are common practice to have there to make sure that, that issues can be raised and that these internal things are not caught up with all the other business that the, 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 the work involves. Because it's always customers are more important, money is more important uh, to keep the company moving forward, but there can be issues creeping in that someone is seeing, but are not covered and, and cleared enough in due time before they become bigger issues. So there should be ability to trigger this. Uh, disputes and governing law. So what is the process to handle disputes if we don't if we don't see eye to eye and we need to have a process to go through? So basically, then this means, for example, that first we we discuss it uh, two times, three times uh, over a period of one month or whatever. If we can't come out to a conclusion, we involve external party, an advisor, board member, a mentor uh, to the conversations to help resolve and give us perspective. If that doesn't help, then maybe we uh, add a lawyer uh, uh, and, and we give certain percentage of power to them uh, to help us decide uh, or drive decision. And the final should be that you go to public court and you go to fight publicly uh, because that's a right that everyone has anyway. You can sue anyone about anything and then it's about who can prove what. But anyone, any of these processes are very harmful for the company. So you should look at uh, designing ways of, of, of making that effective and consider it's like two parents fighting and you should look at the well-being of the child, which is the company, instead of who's right or wrong. That should be the perspective. And in, in some cases, uh, if you are indecisive, that you can't make a decision at all, or the process goes to this long term, usually the company loses more and founders as owners lose more than just making a decision. So sometimes I say you, can, you should even flip a coin and accept that decision uh, or agree that we'll do this. Your view, first six months, then we do this, my view, first six months. And, and then we, by learning, we know which one we do. And we flip a coin and we do mine first or your first. But you should have something to not get into stuck uh, in this. The governing law is basically that uh, you can choose uh, which law which country's law you should use as a base framework. So you don't, you're not obligated to use your home country and specifically you, if you are using, if you have founders from many different countries, uh, you may even want to choose a neutral one or you can use something like UK law, which is a very uh, common law country and, and it's a very long history of, of in business. Some countries' government laws may not be as, as, as kind of thoughtful. Um, and this is because this is a shareholder agreement. This applies between the shareholders, so the company and the founders. And it, it's not tied into, as such, it's not tied into the way the company is registered because the company is just one, one party in the, in the actual agreement. Uh, the market value determination, so basically this is the company valuation and uh, you need that uh, and you need a method to, uh, to kind of calculate that and you can decide what you want to use but you should have 
some kind of logic because this is what you are using to uh, as a tool to, to for example calculate the, the, the number of shares or percentage of ownership different parties should have and, uh, and, and so forth. You can have multiple valuation in one company uh, for those who work for as co-founders or for those who invest with sweat equity and a separate one for those who invest into um, money specifically it gives money as an investment uh, because uh, because of how these things are calculated how much work is worth how much money and then whether there's taxing in, in, involved and, and so forth but these are just the guiding principles a good way to cost effectively and, and effectively evaluate market value is that you should consider as among team members of what is the, the, the valuation of the company that we use to calculate for internal pers uh, perspectives in a case if any of the co-founders would have to leave and the company should buy the shares back or other founders should buy the shares back. And with this thinking, it gives a perspective where you may be the one leaving or you may be the one buying and therefore you kind of automatically as a group are uh, forced to evaluate both sides, selling and buying side, to come up with a sensible number. Uh, and there is no right or wrong way to calculate the valuation. Uh, there are just opinions about the value and then real transaction is what validates that value. Uh, if you look at the, the dragon den or the lion's den or different names of this shark tank, you can see how much the valuation, you know, conversation fluctuates between different parties. And, um, and that's the reality of, of how valuation happens in practice. Doesn't matter who accountant you put to calculate, it's what variables they use to, to, to take into account when, when valuing that. And that is what changes a lot. How an investor sees the company potential versus founders versus some company in the market existing uh, and, and so forth. Um, that those, those vary a lot. So then uh, the tasks and roles of partners. So what type of uh, responsibilities, the main responsibilities, the core roles of each of the, the members in the agreement. Basically, their responsibilities in return of what rights they have. And this should be the guiding principle of main responsibility area, not necessarily uh, defining areas that, uh, that are not, not covered. Because everyone as a co-founder should have really caring for whatever needs to be done for the company. That together you'll resolve it. That's part of the attitude part. And then finally, the ownership structures, commitments. So how long are we going to commit to this agreement uh, to deliver? Uh, how much time are we contributing in return of the ownership alone without getting paid any other salary or other means? <clears throat> uh, the vesting is there basically. It's a mechanism to, to, uh, to limit the, the ownership uh, of those shares that you have, uh, dependent on the actions that you actually deliver on all of those tasks, roles, commitments, and, and time contributions over the period of time that you do. Uh, rules and, and kind of communication about if a shareholder or key stakeholder entry or exit from the agreement. So if someone leaves uh, the company, what happens to the ownership uh, or if new parties are taken in, how is the ownership going to be uh, divided, uh, new shares, dilution for everyone or if there's some other arrangements. Uh, and these can include buying back the shares, creating new shares, uh, having shares of different uh, values. Uh, of uh, different rights, like voting rights, non-voting rights, like uh, like I think in case of Facebook again, uh, 
that uh, Zuckerberg and, and his wife have uh, put majority of the uh, shares in the hands of foundation, where they still hold personally some of the shares, and I think Mark owns all the voting rights uh, of the entire company, even if he personally holds only a small portion of the shares anymore. So um, many different ways to consider. Uh, what happens if someone leaves in a case of good liver? So an acceptable reason, you know, someone gets sick, a family member gets really sick, and some accident happened, or a bad liver, when someone clearly breaks the rules, the agreement, uh, what should happen then? So you should have different considerations for, for these, these two different uh, aspects. And then also uh, the buyback option. So if it's a good lever and they cannot longer be an operative responsibility, they can no longer deliver on the commitments they were there for, but it's an acceptable reason. So then what happens to the, the, the shares that they still would own? And uh, what, is, what is the, the, the pattern there? And then also if and when there's also shares out there, from existing uh, co-funding team members, even if they are non-voting rights, or if you sell in equity crowdfunding platform and there's some shares out there, is there some rules that limit how those shares can be uh, sold forward uh, or, or when they can sell it. So if someone buys, do they have to hold them for a year before they can sell it and, and things like that. So these are the, the key rules uh, or the key main points. There are still more points also even, the, even the, on the template agreement that we have to help guide the process, but these are the, the most important, important uh, components to discuss. So the ownership allocation is, is usually a, a big uh, Murky question is like, okay, how many, own, how much shares should each of you have? How much of each of us should have? Changes the ownership level? Is there, how does the maturity uh, decision being made? Is there an individual who has the maturity? Is it two, two founders together? Um, and so forth. So many open questions. And uh, usually when seeing, uh, new founders uh, looking at or approaching this is two, two thought process. One is that one founder feels that it's their idea, it's their baby, they should have the maturity, they have some trust issues or they're trying to limit the risks that way that if I have maturity of control then 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 it's, it's risk-free from me but of course that's a big risk to others and it's harder to, harder to uh, invite potentially founders to, to consider being equal if they are not equal in, in reality. The other aspect is that, okay, let's make everyone equal and therefore we just give everyone equal amount of shares. If we have three founders, we give everyone one third and so forth. But missing the, uh, any kinds of commitment levels, missing the time contribution levels, missing additional value like existing IPR, someone puts money, someone takes a loan on behalf of the company, others don't put any money. So failing to count all the aspects of that, what would be fair, uh, is then the, the problem in that sense. So the base logic to be applied should be that, that okay, if we're committing for three years as the initial phase, and it's not like the agreement will outdate, it just means this is for earning our ownership. Um, let's calculate how much time and effort and other contributions we will do for the company or we agree to do or we commit to do uh, at the time of the signing for the next three years. And let's calculate the monetary value. Let's calculate it if everyone is equally A-level person if they have skill sets on, on supporting skill sets on different aspects, you can consider each of your time value the same. But if only if someone is putting 40 hours a week, someone is putting 60 hours a week, 
someone is only part time there for 20 hours a week, now you can understand that the contribution is not equal in that perspective. Also, if someone comes with existing assets, money, uh, existing software code, existing logo, design, website, existing customer base, whatever that may be, then that should be calculated separately as well. Now, in calculating all these together, there's a certain value number that you can get. And now you can compare that, okay, if we calculate everyone's portion based on this value of the contributions they put, now that's uh, the, the, a good base logic for calculating things. And at the same time, if no logic is applied, then you can question, as a, any co-founder you are joining into the venture, how is this fair from my perspective? And there may be a good reasoning and rationale behind that, but at least you know what is the kind of the logic that, that, that we should find some reason to compare what is told or what is discussed about why is this different. And the best thing part is then that now when you have done the agreement and you have basically got your shares, they are, they are still uh, unvested and only when you deliver on those milestones and your contributions, basically you unlock your share <coughs> shares and you have vested shares. So basically, even when you have these shares in your kind of uh, possession or they are in the company's uh, um, ownership table, you still have commitments to deliver on those and if you wouldn't deliver on those, then basically those shares can be taken back uh, because you never delivered on those price. A good lever situation would basically mean that a good lever who, who have vested shares, they could keep the level of ownership and the, the number of shares that they have earned, so where they have delivered their, their contributions and only the shares that they failed to deliver on would be taken back. And then separate conversations could be had uh, on behalf whether the company or other shareholders would want to buy those shares from the person leaving or whether those should be converted to non-voting shares if they are no longer operational position to keep as much of the decision-making power uh, among the founders as possible. Um, but, but these are the, uh, all of the con uh, related topics around that. Now, the bad lever situation would then that you can start as extreme as if, if you break the agreement, you get nothing. So basically, this is a built-in protection for people to actually obey the agreement. And it's much stronger than something like you would have a penalty of certain amount of money that you would have to pay that then perhaps you would have to go to court to try to claim it. Perhaps the person never has such money to pay anyway. And perhaps a competitor just easily says, hey, join our company. What is your penalty? Okay, it's 50,000. We'll pay you to exit that, no problem. So, so you can consider this as extreme as possible, or you can consider that half of those shares come back uh, or so forth. Or you can make it uh, negotiable uh, in the sense that this applies unless you agree something separately. So then of course you can always let a uh, person keep the shares or apply rules of good lever, but that's the leverage then that if someone has clearly broken the rules, uh, if, if uh, now you can say that if you leave now, we let you keep 10%, 20% of the shares. Otherwise, we will treat you badly and we can wait until for however long to prove that you have break the, break the agreement. So these are mechanisms to build, to protect the entity, to protect the ownership, to protect uh, the, the decision-making power on behalf of every single shareholder, because that shareholding is your value that you get for all the contributions that you do on behalf of the company. So, as a summary, uh, to ownership allocation process, agree on how long the initial commitment level would 
P, say three years, agree on each team member's contribution over that period, calculate the shares, additional share considerations for money, other additional contributions, IPR, so forth, and then use vesting to, to basically, that can be based on the time, every year, every six months, or specific milestone. Once we get the product out, once we get to 100 customers, or a combination of this, 50% per time, every six months, 50%, of the vested shares based on the milestone rates and so forth. And then the bad lever penalty um, is there to protect the behavior, ownership, the company and so forth. So the whole point of these uh, tools and rules uh, are foundational elements to avoid all the problems and uh, the typical problems and give more flexibility to, uh, to to work on the on the shares. So if people leave uh, shares that got back from can be used for new hires, capital raise, or shared between remaining team members. Uh, after the th three years have passed, then the, the shareholder agreement just continues from other other terms. But if they're still needing to you know, create more commitment more, more uh, shares, new shares can be created uh, if founders decide so, and new shares can be used in, for existing co-founders or new team members to continue work uh, in return of equity. And once there's the core co-founders, uh, then additional tool can be used, uh, which is stock options. Basically, they are the rights to have certain amount of shares in return of contribution of time or some other assets or so forth. And where, if delivered, then these uh, uh, team members can get those uh, options. And when new shares are created in the time for investors or, or before selling the company or whatnot, that then they, at that time, can convert their options to actual shares to be, to be treated as, as as uh, the portion of shareholding that they would then have. But it doesn't require to actually having shares to creating the new shares just to, to use these options uh, for team members. And also uh, it doesn't require them to, to if then the person or the part party didn't deliver, then basically the options are avoided. Then separately, if someone is actually paid money so salary uh, in the venture as well, that's additional that needs to be counted on. So if someone is paid and someone else is not paid, now that also needs to be calculated. You can't be having in a paid position where others are not in paid position and also expect to get equal amount of ownership for your contribution because you're paid with other means. So the whole salary and the payment of earning uh, earning the, the, the finances from the venture needs to be calculated in all forms. Including also if there are things like taking loans on behalf or even giving personal guarantees on behalf of the company. That has value uh, that either should be done equally or in the, in the same percentage as the ownership shares or then the ones who will take more risk, financial risk in the form of loan or guarantee, then they should get more shares or other compensation. So with these rules and tools, many other restrictions and rules can be applied, whatever you want to include, that it would be important in your company uh, to protect um, protect the company and protect uh, and the behavior or to drive the behavior or uh, avoid a certain pain behavior that you don't want to be seen. Uh, then the rights to back buy shares and so forth. And as, as long also uh, new shares can be created uh, as long as the decision making power is there or unless, uh, for example, investors usually limit the ability to create new shares for obvious reasons. 
uh, in, in this case. 